going on YouTube it's just my opinion and today I will be doing a sports topic by myself again Joel Embiid has become injured he was one of the bright shining stars uh, that really came out from this year should have been an all-star I thought he got snubbed but I can understand why but again he's injured he already missed his first two seasons and he's gonna miss the remainder of this season and so it begs the question, is he going to become a what-if player or a what-could-have-been player? So I decided to put together a list of 12 players in which are the biggest what-if and what-could-have-been players uh, in NBA history. Now, again, this list is it's subjective, and I basically based the list off of the severity of the injury uh, the popularity of the player and how detrimental it was to the organization and to the NBA as a whole. Now starting my list off at number 12 I have Jay Williams the Duke superstar who won an NCAA championship back in 2001 and was named the NCAA player of the year in 2002. He was drafted number two in the 2002 NBA draft overall only behind Yao Ming. He was drafted to the Chicago Bulls. Now he was, in my eyes, a true point guard who could still score the basketball, uh, was a great shooter, and also not only that, but he was a uh, good playmaker as well. After his rookie year in the summer of 2003, he got into an unfortunate motorcycle accident that ultimately ended his career and it took extensive physical therapy for years just for him to be able to use his legs. He could have never been able to use his legs again, so he's just fortunate to be able to use his legs, and uh, truly a shame and a tragic accident that ruined the career of what could have been potentially a great player for the Chicago Bulls post Michael Jordan. Now next on my list at number 11 is Brandon Roy, he was picked number six overall in the 2006 NBA draft by the Timberwolves, but was traded over to the Trailblazers, in which his rookie season in 2006-2007, he won the Rookie of the Year. He was a prolific scorer with great athletic ability and very underrated as far as his clutch gene goes. When he was in his prime, he was a three-time All-Star and he was a part of a Trailblazers team that included him and LaMarcus Aldridge, as well as Greg Oden, that could have been great. In his 2011 season, he, we started to notice a drastic decline in his production and his stats goes, and it ultimately led to him uh, the following summer before the 2012 lockout season to retire based off of the fact that throughout the course of his career he had had multiple surgeries that ultimately led to him having little to no cartilage in his knees. Now again, he could have been still one of the better shooting guards in the league had he still been in the league currently. Now at number 10 on this list, I have Hank Gathers, who was a Loyola Marymount superstar who in his junior year at college, he led the NCAA in both points and rebounding, was projected to not only be uh, a heavy favorite for Player of the Year honors, but was also projected to be a high lottery pick for the 1990 draft. And unfortunately, in a game during the season against the Portland Pilots, he actually collapsed and died on the court mid-game due to a heart muscle disorder. He was only 23 years old when he died and is truly one of the more tragic stories in college basketball. Now next on this list is my boy, I'm actually wearing his jersey right now, Grant Hill of the Detroit Pistons at number 9. He was a two-time national champion at Duke and also a player of the year at Duke. Now, he was drafted number three overall by the Detroit Pistons and was actually co-rookie of the year, uh, his rookie year, with Jason Kidd. 
He was a seven-time All-Star. There was even a couple years there where he actually passed Michael Jordan in the vote-getting on the All-Star game ballot. There's been a long list of players that everybody has stated, oh, well, he's going to be the next Jordan. This guy potentially could be the next Jordan. Grant Hill was basically the first guy to actually be titled the next Jordan. He was averaging around 22 points a game, uh, 6 assists a game, and 8 rebounds per game. And only three other players in their first several years in the NBA were able to accomplish numbers like that, and that includes the Big O, Oscar Robertson, Larry Bird, and LeBron. He went to Orlando for the 2000-2001 season and was supposed to team up with T-Mac. Throughout his first four seasons there in Orlando, he only played a total of 47 games due to his ankle problems. And he almost even died in 2003 because of that ankle problem due to a really bad infection in his ankle. The only reason why I did not put Grant Hill a little bit higher on this list is because of the fact that he was very, very resilient and was still able to last a total of 19 seasons in the NBA, even with all these ankle problems, still was able to be a seven-time All-Star and put up 17,000 points for his career. It just goes to show what if it wasn't for that ankle problem, how good that Orlando Magic team could have been, how much better his career could have been as a whole, uh, we will just never know. Now at number eight on my list, I have Reggie Lewis, who was drafted to the Boston Celtics back in 1987. And from 1989 until 1993, he only missed nine games, was very, very healthy, and he was progressively getting better and better each year. He was showing to be a very athletic and versatile shooting guard in the NBA. He was quick and was very good at attacking the basket. And he actually made his first All-Star game in 1992. But in that following summer, he actually died during a Boston Celtic practice due to a heart condition. He was supposed to be one of the main leaders post Larry Bird that was able to continue the legacy of the Boston Celtics. And it took a long time after the fact that he died before they could even get back into a contending team in the Eastern Conference. So this is a big loss not only for the NBA as a whole, but more specifically for the Boston Celtics. Now at number seven on my list, we have my boy Yao Ming. He was a star over in China before he was drafted number one overall in 2002 by the Houston Rockets. He was a giant at 7'6". He still had great power, but also great finesse. And he also had great touch and footwork around the basket. He was an all-star every season he played. He was an eight-time all-star. And he was the leading vote getter for many, many years in a row. And he was breaking tons of all-star balloting voting records in the process. Now, in his first three seasons in the NBA, he only missed a total of two games. But in his last six seasons in the NBA, he went on to miss about 250 games, including the entire 2009 and 2010 season due to foot and ankle problems, which ultimately cut his career short. Averaged 19 points a game, two blocks a game, and 9.5 rebounds a game for his career. It just goes to show what if he was able to remain healthy, how great of a center would he have been, where would he have ranked amongst the all-time centers in the NBA? It was such a shame to see him depart so early as well because he was perhaps the biggest global ambassador in the NBA in NBA history. Now at number six on my list, I have Greg Oden, who in his freshman year at Ohio State actually led his team to the NCAA championship game. He was already labeled in his freshman year as a cannot miss center, was actually drafted number one overall in the 2007 draft by the Portland Trailblazers over Kevin Durant. His career was from 2007 to, to 2012, 
but in that time span he only played a total of 82 games and he actually missed three full seasons two back-to-back in a row a lot of people consider him to be the biggest bust or one of the biggest busts in NBA history I would consider guys like Kwame Brown and Eddie Curry guys like that I would put them above him because at least they played out their full careers. They never really had injury issues, but they just were god-awful players, and they had no impact while they were out there on the court. At least Greg Oden had impact out there on the court while he was out there. He was a pretty dominant presence inside and was an amazing rebounder and amazing defender and shot blocker while he was playing. So for that reason alone... I do not consider him the biggest bust in NBA draft history, but it just goes to show what could have been for the Portland Trail Blazers had they not drafted Greg Oden and drafted Kevin Durant instead. Now, number five is one of my favorite players of all time, Penny Hardaway. He was drafted number three overall in the 1993 NBA draft by the Golden State Warriors, but wound up getting traded to the Magic for the number one overall pick, which was Chris Webber, so that he could team up and play with Shaq. Both him and Shaq together were supposed to be the new dynamic duo, the new Magic and uh, Kareem. Another big point guard that was able to shoot, was very athletic, and was also a great playmaker, being 6'7". Now, Penny was a four-time All-Star, and in just the second season together, Uh, They actually wound up making the 1995 NBA Finals but lost in four games to the Houston Rockets. But they actually beat Michael Jordan that season in the semifinal. Easily became one of the most popular players in the NBA. A lot of people were questioning at that point whether or not it was Shaq's team or it was Penny's team. Now after that 1996 season, Shaq wound up splitting. So it ultimately became Penny's team there in Orlando, but he actually missed almost the entire 1998 NBA season, and this was due to knee injuries. Ultimately got traded over to the to the Phoenix Suns in 2000, and he wound up actually having two knee surgeries in 2001 that were just detrimental to his career. We definitely would have loved to see what could have become of Penny Hardaway, uh, especially due to his success very early on in his career over there in Orlando. And while him and Shaq were there, it just goes to show what could have been for that Orlando Magic team had both of them stayed together, stayed healthy. How dominant of a team and a franchise could that have been uh, over the years. Now, at number four on this list, we have my man Derek Rose. He was the number one overall pick in the 2008 draft by the Chicago Bulls. Wound up winning Rookie of the Year that year. He's a three time All Star. And in 2011, uh, which was the same year actually that the Miami Heat Big Three formed. The Chicago Bulls wound up having the best record in the East, and he wound up winning the MVP of the league that year, was the youngest player in NBA history to win the MVP award at the age of 22. Next year, the following year, in the lockout season, they again had the best record in the East in 2012, and unfortunately, in his first playoff game that season against the 76ers, I believe, he wound up tearing his left ACL, which made him miss the entire 2013 NBA season. He returned in 2014, but only played in 10 games before tearing his right ACL. And ever since then, he has not been the same player. He was one of the most explosive point guards that we have ever seen in NBA history. He was set to be a top five player in the NBA for the next five to ten years. And he was such a beacon of light for that city in Chicago. They were posting the best records for the Chicago Bulls while he was there. Post Michael Jordan, he was supposed to be the next big Chicago superstar for them and was hopefully going to lead them to the promised land 
for the first time since Michael Jordan, and he was from Chicago. Uh, he was a hometown kid, a hometown hero. Uh, such a sad story for the city of Chicago. Now, at number three on my list, I have Bill Walton, who was one of the greatest NCAA college basketball players of all time, was a three-time player of the year and a two-time NCAA champion at UCLA while he was over there. And he was drafted number one overall in 1974. But due to some injuries, he wasn't able to play his first full NBA season until 1976-1977, which in that year, his team, the Portland Trailblazers, actually won the NBA championship, and he was named the MVP of the NBA Finals. Now, Bill Walton was an excellent rebounder and shot blocker, outstanding defender inside, and he was very fluid in the post and a great passing big, one of the first really good passing big men. Now in the following season, 1977-1978, he only played in 60 games, but he actually won the MVP of the league that year. Now he actually came back for the uh, NBA playoffs that year, but he wound up re-injuring his foot, which had been giving him problems throughout his entire career and especially that season as well. She went to the Clippers the following season and he actually only played in 14 games in his first three seasons there with the Clippers. This guy had all the potential in the world to be one of the greatest centers in NBA history. I put him so high on this list as well because he was essentially the start of the cursed Portland Trail Blazers franchise. They have just had a long list of players who have been injured and a long list of guys that they could have drafted over all of these injured players. Now at number two, Arvidas Sabonis. He was a Lithuanian player who became pro at just the young age of 17 years old. Now he had won a ton of European championships and MVPs before being drafted in 1986 by the Portland Trail Blazers. And he actually was a part of the 1988 uh, Olympic gold Soviet team that actually forced the U.S. to bring back NBA players playing in the Olympics. If it wasn't for Arvidas Sabonis, we may have never even seen the Dream Team be assembled in 1992. Due to Cold War restrictions, he wasn't able to actually make his NBA debut until 1995-1996 with the Trail Blazers, which at that point, he was already on the tail end of his career and he also was plagued with a lot of injuries. He really redefined the center position. He was one of the first centers to really impl be implemented in the pick and pop system. He was an outstanding passer at the uh, at the center position. He was essentially titled the 7-3 version of Larry Bird. And he is one of the most influential players in the European style of basketball today. If it wasn't for him, we probably would not have seen a lot of these European players come over and influence the NBA game that they had. It just goes to show what if he was able to play in his prime in the NBA throughout the late 80s and early 90s. And at number one on my list, I have Len Bias, who was a two-time ACC Player of the Year at Maryland and was the NCAA Player of the Year in 1986. He was actually the bigger, stronger, and better version in a lot of people's eyes of Michael Jordan. He had better stats. At, than Michael Jordan at college and he was actually supposed to be more NBA ready at the time than Michael Jordan when he was coming into the NBA. Now when Bias was drafted number two overall in the 1986 draft by the Boston Celtics and unfortunately just two days later Len Bias wound up dying due to cardiac arrest because of a cocaine overdose one of the saddest and most tragic stories in 
basketball history. Many people consider him the greatest player to never play in the NBA, and it goes to show what if Len Bias was able to actually play in the NBA. He would have joined forces with Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish on a team that had just won the NBA title the year before. It goes to show would he have been better than Jordan? Would the Celtics have been the best team hands down in the NBA for years to come, especially in the East? Would the bad boy Pistons have happened if it wasn't for the fact that Len Bias died? Would Michael Jordan have taken longer to have won an NBA championship if it wasn't for Len Bias? We will never know. And that concludes my top 12 biggest NBA misfortune, player misfortunes in history. Now, if you agree or disagree with my list, if you think that you would reorder my list, or if there are players on my list that you would include, players that did not make my list, please comment below. While you do that, also like and subscribe. And again, remember, this is just my opinion. And thank you for watching, YouTube.